when you think about a major league baseball player who's been known as a home run hitter, but he goes through a slump and then he comes out on the other side, you might say that he's got his swing back. He's back to hitting like normal. You take a football player in the National Football League and he's the running back and he's not been making the yardage that he usually made. But then a game or two and he's back to gaining 100 yards and he's running like he used to. You might say he's got his legs back. You take a professional golfer who may not have the swing that he used to have and he's scoring higher than he usually has. And then all of a sudden he starts winning some tournaments and you might say he's back in the groove or he's back in his swing. You take an automobile mechanic who works on a car that has a spark plug that's misfiring and he repairs the spark plug and the car begins to run. Some say it even purrs and you'll say, well, it's hitting on all cylinders now. Well, in speaking of worship, the pastors are getting back in the pulpit and just like a cowboy who falls off his horse and gets back in the saddle and we might say he's back in the saddle again, well, coming this June the 21st at 11 a.m., Victory Baptist Church in Douglasville, Georgia, Lord willing, will get her worship back. And I'm looking forward to it, and I hope that you are too. And I want to just say a few words to those of you who have been faithful in giving. You Victory Baptist Church members, you've been praying for your church, you've been uh, staying in contact with fellow members, checking on them. Uh, you've been sending me notes and encouraging me. God bless you. You're the pastors. You're the ministers of the church. And the church is only as good as every member is good. And so I want to thank you and express my appreciation to that. And another thing, that when we come back next Sunday, Lord willing, the 21st of June, which is Father's Day, we're going to call it our Father's Day. We're not neglecting the fathers just like we didn't neglect the mothers during Mother's Day when we couldn't get together. But we're going to be focusing on our Father, our Father who art in heaven. And we're coming back as God's children in God's place on God's day. And we're going to worship our Father. Now, there are some that are still uh, worried and uncomfortable about gathering uh, together at this time this soon and that's quite all right there's no shame no guilt if that's you don't worry about it you come and join the rest of us when you feel comfortable and we're going to do just one service a week for two or three weeks and uh, we're going to reevaluate then and see if we uh, can continue worshiping and maybe add a worship service on Sunday evening or Wednesday night uh, we just don't know and so you keep praying about it, but we will, Lord willing, as I say, and are going to join and come together at 11 a.m. on June the 21st. And I'll share just a little bit more about how we're going to do some things just a little bit differently. But I'm so glad that Victory Baptist Church is getting her worship back. And if you're viewing as a non-member of Victory Baptist Church, welcome. I'm Pastor James Cook of Victory Baptist Church in Douglasville, Georgia. And I invite you, along with our members, to take your copy of God's Word and turn to the fourth chapter of John's Gospel. John's Gospel, chapter 4. And we're going to be looking at the story at, of the, when Jesus meets a woman of Samaria at the well, Jacob's well in Samaria, okay? And we're going to be talking about when Victory Baptist Church gets her worship back. And we're going to be looking at worship. What is worship? And why is it so important that we worship? And why is it so important that we come together to worship? All right, we're in John chapter 4, and I want you to begin reading with me at verse 19. John chapter 4, verse 19. Now, Jesus has been, uh, has been in Jerusalem. He's traveling north, and he says that he must go through Samaria, the area of Samaria. And this was very significant because usually the Jews would go around Samaria on either side 
of the area of Samaria because uh, they didn't have anything to do with the Samaritans. They were half breeds. They were uh, half Jewish and half of some Gentile believers. And they wouldn't have anything to do with the Samaritan people. But Jesus said, I must go through Samaria. He knew that he had a divine appointment with a woman at a well. And so they have traveled through Samaria, Jesus and his disciples. And Jesus, being a man, as if he were not God, at the same time being God as if he were not man, got tired. And he sat down at a well while his disciples went on to find some food for them. And this is where he encounters the woman of Samaria at Jacob's well. And so we're in verse 19. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Now if you'll go back and read the preceding verses, you'll see that Jesus had sat down at the well, and this Samaritan woman, this half-breed woman, half Jew and half another nationality, came and drew or was going to draw water from the well at midday. Now the women usually came early in the morning. But you'll find out that this woman was uh, a woman of ill repute, if you will. And she didn't want to mix with other women because probably of the ridicule that she would have received. So she comes at midday and uh, she comes to draw water and Jesus asked her to give her something to drink. And the woman says, how, how, why are you a Jewish man asking me, a Samaritan woman, uh, to draw some water for you. Uh, the Jews don't have anything to do with the Samaritans and much more, uh, the, uh, much less a Jewish man with a Samaritan woman. And Jesus said, woman, if you knew who was talking to you, you would ask me for some water. And Jesus went on to explain the water that you're drinking and that you're trying to draw from this well, you're going to drink it and you're going to get thirsty again. But the water that I have to offer you is water that once you take a drink of it, it's like a well that springs up inside of you and it never runs dry and you'll never thirst again. Of course, Jesus was talking about eternal life. And uh, Jesus said uh, to this woman when she said something about a husband, he, and she said, uh, I don't have a husband. He said, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands, and the man you're with now is not your husband. And this was a woman that he just met. She had never seen Jesus in all her life, but Jesus knew everything about her. And this caused her to do some introspection and evaluation, reevaluation of who this man was that was talking to her at the well. And of course, it's Jesus. And she says in verse 19, chapter 4, The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. <laughs> Amen. He was a prophet. And if you contrast chapter 4 with chapter 3, Jesus saw Nicodemus at night, a religious man. Nicodemus said to Jesus, said, I perceive, or we know that you are a teacher come from God. When Jesus told Nicodemus, I'm not a teacher come from God. I'm God who's come to teach. And in the same way, as you contrast that Jesus is meeting a woman now in the middle of the day, and she's not religious, she's a woman of ill repute, if you remember what I just said. And uh, she's had five husbands with a sixth man now. And so she says, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Prophet nothing, he's the Lord Jesus Christ, but he hasn't revealed himself to her yet, and he will in just a little bit. And so she starts getting all spiritual now, okay? When she thinks that she's talking to somebody that's uh, uh, with some spiritual significance. And she says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. And verse 21, Jesus said unto her woman, Believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you not know what? We know that we worship for salvation is of the Jews. And then he says in verse 23, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Now we're talking about getting back as a church, Victory Baptist Church, getting our worship back. And what I mean by that, getting back our public worship. 
But Jesus tells us here that worship, true worship, doesn't just happen at a place. Worship is not a place, but a person. He says, we must worship God in spirit and in truth. Now, the place has its place. It is of significance. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, the Bible says for us Christians, not to forsake the assembling of ourselves, as some are doing, but to come together. And if you come together, you've got to have a place to come together. It doesn't have to be in this place, but have a place. But for Victory Baptist Church, this church building at 4414 Highway 92 and 166, half a mile north of Newton Manchester High School, in uh, Douglasville, Georgia, 30135, is the place that we as individuals come together to worship. And I'm looking forward to doing that. Boy, I can't wait to call on some of you to pray, to hear Brother Maurice pray, to hear Brother Ray White to pray, to hear Brother Clint Went to pray, call on old Jimmy Hildebrand to pray, and to see Brother Guy up in the uh, booth, the sound booth, and to have Sister Lynn up here in the choir, and to see y'all coming in and sitting, looking up at the pastor, looking at each other, talking to one another, heads bowed and praying, voices joining in unison and singing. I can't wait, and I hope that you can't wait either. I tell you what, I'm looking forward to seeing y'all face to face rather than just staring at this old camera. And I know that you're getting tired of looking at me so close up. See, you can come and you can sit way back in the back if you want to. You don't have to see me that close. But it'll be wonderful to get together. And when we come together, we're going to take safety precautions. We will have the masks to wear. We're going to have the hand sanitizer. We're going to have cones out in the parking lot blocking off every other parking space. We're going to be meeting you at the door, asking you to come in single file. Families can come together. We'll have the doors, both of them open, so you won't be crowded, squashed in, squished in, uh, coming in. And then we're going to have some of the pews blocked off so we can have some safe distancing. And again, we'll have the mask for you to wear. We'll ask you to wear the mask. And uh, I'll wear one until I get up in the pulpit, and I'll try not to holler to you too much and spit out where the any germs I might have I don't think I have any germs I'm feeling fine we'll ask you though if you have a fever or feeling sick uh, just put it off another week until you get feeling better come back and uh, we'll ask you to dismiss in an orderly fashion not to gather in the vestibule or the fellowship hall but if you want to to step outside where you have a little more space we're going to take all the precautions that we can so we don't want to make it a uh, 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 worship service where you come out with some health problems. No, we're going to do that. And again, we're going to do that three, four, uh, two, three weeks and we'll reevaluate it as pastor and church council. And we might add another service. I'll continue to do the Wednesday night services, but I won't continue to do the Sunday morning. Uh, I just can't see a way I can do it. I may do a little devotional way uh, or for you, for those who can't come. And again, if you don't feel comfortable coming, you want to take a little more time, feel perfectly in your right and non-judged for doing that. We are going to start, and we're going to start with one, those who want to come or can come, and we'll work on up to getting everybody back when they feel comfortable to do so. So worship is a place. Also in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 and 12, it said that God gave some pastors and preachers and teachers for the edifying, the building up of the saints. Now, video technology, it's wonderful, and it's helped us to stay in some contact, but face-to-face -face is even better, and that's uh, what God has given us, pastors and teachers, and it's kind of hard to pastor and teacher if you don't have anybody in the presence to pastor or teach, and uh, in this COVID is being over, be looking forward to getting in some homes, seeing you again and then also seeing you at church. And it will be a blessing for us to gather again. I'm looking forward to it. But listen, worship is not just a place. Really, it is not a place. The Samaritan woman said that, listen, uh, our fathers, talking about her, her heritage, uh, said that we worship here on this mountain. And the mountain she was referring to was nearby Mount Gerizim. 
and said, we worship there, but you Jews say that you worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, you know what? It is true that we are to worship in Jerusalem and uh, the salvation comes from the Jews and what you've done has not been scripturally approved and uh, that's the wrong place. Jerusalem's the right place. But he says there's coming a day when those who worship the Lord will worship Him, not just in a place, but they'll worship Him in spirit and in truth. And so he's talking about that the worshipers, the true worshipers, when Victory Baptist Church gets its worship back, it will worship in spirit and in truth. Now that's what we've been trying to do and that's what we're going to continue to do in spirit as in comparison to just mere uh, uh, man's efforts, we've got to have the Spirit. And of course, we understand biblically that the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, dwell in us, and it is He that we worship, and it's He that helps us to worship, for God is a Spirit. And we must worship in truth. And not only in sincerity, but in truth. Not only in the Spirit, but in truth. And truth is based on the Word of God. Uh, the words of God are true and Amen. And in truth, as compared and in contrast with man's religious rituals and ceremonies and all kinds of things that we do to try to make ourselves to look spiritual. See, Jesus was not only getting on to the Samaritans for them worshiping in the wrong place, but he was also getting on to the Jews for worshiping in the wrong way. They could bow the head and bend the knee but the worship, the true worship, was not in them. Their heart was not in it. And that's what Jesus is saying. He says that we must worship in spirit and truth. Now, we're looking forward to coming back on Sunday and Victory Baptist Church getting her worship back. But don't come to church to look for worship. Bring your worship with you. Let me repeat that again. Don't just come to church to worship. Bring your worship with you. You must have a personal time of worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ, getting right with Him, praising Him. The word worship means, simply means all that I am, responding to all that God is. And God is spirit, and God in spirit gives us the provision and power and peace and the propitiation for our sins that we need. God is more than just mere man, and you just can't put a face on God because, I mean, whose face would you put on Him? He's spirit, and He's revealed Himself to us, though, through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, and we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. It's not mere formalities. It's not form or fashion, but it's the Lord Jesus Christ whom we worship. We worship the Father through the Spirit, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we are. So don't just come to church thinking that you're going to be bringing an empty bag and we're supposed to fill it up with worship and you take it home. No, bring your worship with you. It's like the fellowship meals that we have. Everybody brings a covered plate and we put it out on the table and we all feast from one another's contribution. Bring your worship with you and let's put it out on the table and let's all feast, spiritually speaking, and worship the Lord from everyone's contribution. And especially, we have to be dependent on the Holy Spirit to give us that presence of His that we might worship Him, that power that He has that we might worship Him, the peace that comes through salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, that there's no enmity, there's no wall, there's no division between God, who we say that we come to worship because we've been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, we've been made pure, we're clean, and we have access to the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ that we might worship him. Oh, bring your worship with you and let's all share it and let's all offer it to the Lord Jesus Christ and worship Him in spirit and in truth. We'll worship a person, not just at a place, and we'll worship in spirit and truth and we'll do worship in a way that makes a difference. Look back at verse 24. Jesus continuing and speaking to the woman at the well, telling her, that God is spirit and we must worship Him in spirit and truth. And the last part of verse 23 says, 
For the Father seeks those to worship Him. He's not looking for church buildings, their ornate furnishings, their structure on the outside. You can meet under a, uh, 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 some palm branches that make shade out in the middle, middle of the desert, and you can have better worship than the biggest churches in downtown Atlanta or any other metropolitan city. It is not the building that makes the difference. It is the believer who makes the difference. The believer who comes to worship in spirit and in truth. And so it says, God is the spirit, and they that worship him, in verse 24 I'm reading from, for, from, God is the spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And God is looking for those kind of people. Did you know that if you're worshiping in spirit and truth, God is looking for you? He really is. And the Psalms say that God inhabits the praises of his people. You ever feel like the devil's hanging around too close to you? One way to run him off is start worshiping the Lord Jesus Christ in spirit and in truth. And God says, I'll inhabit the praises of my people. That is, he'll come and dwell with you that worship him in spirit and truth. And when we worship in that spirit and truth and God dwells in our presence in a very powerful and, pre and, and, and uh, uh, literal way, if you will, the devil has to leave. He can't stay in the same place uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is. So let's bring our worship with us and praise the Lord. And then thirdly, if I hadn't already told you this, we are to worship in a way that makes a difference. That is, some of us are looking for church to get back to normal. I understand what you're saying. But you know, we've been through a lot of stuff these last three months. Could you imagine the week, the last week that we had service? of what was going to take place, not only the COVID virus, but the uh, injustice that was visualized across our nation and the responses that we've had to that and how it has shaken us to our core. Uh, we ought to come back to church different and our worship ought to be different. We're worshiping the same God, but now because we have been absent from one another and not able to worship. That ought to cause us to be a little more appreciative of the privilege that we have to come together. And no more waking up on Sunday morning and saying, I don't feel like going to church. God just might make it where you don't feel like going to church for the rest of your life. And God doesn't uh, play these games. We're to come to worship with Him. And it should have been a time of re-examining ourselves. And then to understand that God has made us all of one blood, of one flesh, and none of us are superior <laughs> to any other, and we shouldn't be uh, uh, demonstrating that or acting like that in any way. Someone has well said that the ground at the foot of the cross is level. Listen, we're all sinners, and we need to be saved. And I need your help. I don't care what color you are. I don't care from where you've come. I don't care what your past is. Uh, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're my brother or you're my sister in Christ, and we're a family and I need your help, and I want to help you. This has been a time of re-examination for this old pastor, and I've got a congregation of a lot of people that have been hurt, and they've been shaken in a different way than I've been hurt and I've been shaken. And we have to look at one of other's needs, and God's placed us in this church at Victory Baptist Church, I believe, with all my heart, for us to not only recognize one another's needs, but try to do something about it in the name of Jesus Christ. I'm not looking for a government program. I've already got my program from the Bible. The government's failed us in so many ways. The government's helped some. Yes, it has. But the Bible, a government based on the Bible... And our living based on the Bible is our best answer yet. There's nothing better than living out the Word of God. I said living out the Word of God. I can profess it, but not possess it. I can say I believe it, but not live it out. That's the difference. We have to live it out with one another. And we have to be God's children and get together. And it ought to make a difference. Now, it made a difference in this woman's life. Look at verse uh, 25. The woman saith unto the hymn, he says... I, she said, I know the Messiah is coming, which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. That's just another way of what many of us have been saying today. When Jesus comes back, he'll make it all right. That's what she's saying. He'll tell us all things. He'll tell us whether or not we're worshiping here 
is if it's right, if I'm living my life the right way, I'm telling you what, we're looking forward to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but you better be ready for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The reason that the pastor and the reason that the Bible and the reason that God tells us to be ready is that we might repent and get right for when He does come back. And like a thief that comes in the night and we're not ready for Him, the Lord Jesus Christ is coming, and we need to be ready for Him coming back. And so this woman says, he, He's going to tell us all things. Well, Jesus says in verse 26, I that speak unto you am He. We don't have to wait till Jesus comes back to straighten things out. He's already given us for His Word to straighten things out. And if we don't get it straightened out now, we don't want Him to come back to straighten it out because it's going to be it's going to be awful. It's going to be t uh, horror for some people. We need to get right with Jesus, and we need to get right according to His Word. Now, when he told her that he was the Messiah, this is her response. And upon this uh, came his disciples and marveled that he talked to, to with the woman, yet no man said, Whom seekest thou, or why talkest to her? And the woman, in verse 28, then left her water pot. Now, she, that was a very uh, uh, useful thing, was, <laughs> to leave your water pot. Uh, meant that something was very urgent for you to leave it, and something was very urgent. And she left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith unto the men, this is what she said, Come and see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? This is the difference worship made in her life. When she left church there, it was she and he at the well, Jacob's well. They had church there at Jacob's well, the Samaritan woman and the Lord Jesus Christ. And she took off back to town, and she didn't tell how wonderful the sermon was and how good it was to see so-and-so and where she went to eat after the worship service and how that the weather was nice and that so-and-so didn't speak to her and so-and-so didn't shake their hand or that they saw somebody at church today that they hadn't seen in a long time and it was a good thing because they needed to be at church. No, she went back and she shared her experience and her experience was all based on meeting Jesus. And when she met Jesus, she couldn't wait to tell others to come meet him too. He had done something in her life that changed her life. This is a man that knows everything I've ever done. And I'm telling you, he knows everything that I've done. He knows everything that you've done. And you better come to Jesus and go ahead and confess it. He already knows it and ask for his mercy and he's willing to give it. That's why he came to this world to die for your sin and my sin that we might give our hearts to him and give our worship to him because worship, as I meant to tell you earlier, means that he is worthy of all that we are, responding to all that he is. And what I forgot to tell you is all that he is is everything. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. I am the door to heaven. I am the vine and you're the branches. You can't do anything without me. I am the resurrection and the life. He's everything, and He deserves our worship. It's based on His worthiness, and He's more worthy than anybody. He's not number one on the scale of, of the top ten. He's the only one. He is the sovereign Lord Jesus Christ. He said, come and meet this man. Is not this the Christ? What other evidence do you need? What other evidence do you need? And I need that Jesus came in the flesh. He bore our sins on Calvary. He died. He was placed in a tomb. And on the third day, He rose again to life. Sometimes when I'm witnessing to somebody, they'll say, uh, Pastor, if God really loved me, why doesn't He show me? What more can He do than to send His only begotten Son that died on the cross for you? Showed you how much He loved you. What more can anybody do? No one can do more than what God has done for you and given Him His very best. You better worship Him. And then it says in verse 30 and 31, Then they went out of the city, came unto him, and in the meanwhile his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. They came back with the food and said, Jesus, we want you to eat. Jesus said, I'm not hungry now. Somebody says, well, who gave you some food? And he said, I've had some food that you don't know of. It's not food, meat and bread. 
and potatoes, for man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word out of the mouth of God. He had some spiritual food, and he was living and thriving on that. He had led somebody to himself. They placed their faith and trust in Jesus. And so, in verse 39, it says, And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, remember these were half-breeds, breeds, they were rejected and despised. They uh, suffered injustices under the Jews who thought they were better than them. And the Samaritans come out to them, came, and they besought him that he would stay with them. And he abode there two days. He stayed with them two days. And many more believed because of his own word. And they said unto the woman, Now listen here, now we believe, not because of just what you said, but we have heard him with our own ears ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Oh, Victory Baptist Church is going to get her worship back on. And we're going to come and worship in this place, but it's not the place that we worship. We're going to come and worship the person, the Lord Jesus Christ. It is our Father's day, and our Father's children will come to worship Him. And we're going to come and worship in spirit and truth. The spirit in you bears, uh, bears witness with the spirit in me because we're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to take this Bible, and I'm going to open it up, and I'm going to preach God's Word to you, asking God to help me. And we're going to preach, and we're going to sing, and we're going to pray, and we're going to fellowship, and we're going to worship in such a way that when we leave this next Sunday, June 21st, we're going to leave differently than when we came in. Because that, that's what God calls us to do. And we're not just going to come to worship, we're going to bring our worship with us, and then when we leave, we're going to take our worship with us too, that we might share it with others and tell them, come see a man that knows all about me and save me. Oh, what a difference it makes. Sometimes when a man goes off to war and he uh, experiences the horrors of war and he comes back, family might say he's not the same man coming back as he was when he left. Well, I want to tell you, we're not going to have war here. What he experienced in wartime, we're going to experience in worship time. And it ought to be said of us when we come and gather together in God's house, it ought to be said of us from those who know us the best, you know since you started worshiping together with other believers at Victory Baptist Church or whatever church you worship at, you know you're not the same person, but not in a negative way, in a positive way. People ought to know that we've had an audience with one and we've bowed the head and bended the knee and given the heart to worship Him. And we didn't just leave it at the church. We took it with us to share with everyone else. Oh, Victory Baptist Church, let it be our prayer that we'll get our worship back on. God bless you. I love you. I'm looking forward to seeing you eyeball to eyeball and hearing your precious voice and experiencing your wonderful presence as we all gather together to worship Him.